Zoom's unique audio channel architecture, meeting participants can select their language channel of choice to listen and participate in meetings. The meeting audio will be simultaneously translated into their preferred language by live interpreters, and participants will hear their translation at 80% volume with the original speaker at 20% so they can still hear tone and intonation for greater understanding. Welcome to all our offices around the world. Bless the day, everyone. Let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. You turn. Your presence, all our fears are wash away, wash away.
La editorial CLC tiene el privilegio de publicar para Hispanoamérica el tercer volumen de este estudio, La Lámpara Inextinguible del Pacto. Como director de CLC Colombia tengo la responsabilidad de distribuir libros de sana doctrina, pero sobre todo de formación teológica. Conocer personalmente el Ministerio de Historia de la Redención en Seúl, Corea y ver la pasión y la dedicación con que el reverendo Abraham Park trabajó en este estudio es maravilloso. La lámpara inextinguible del pacto está escrito en cinco partes y 26 capítulos. Parte 1 dice Dios es mayor que todos. Parte número 2. La administración de Dios, de la historia de la redención y la genealogía de Jesucristo. Parte 3. La genealogía de Jesucristo, la historia del primer periodo. Parte 4. La historia de los jueces. Y la quinta parte, desde Saúl hasta David. La lámpara inextinguible del pacto es un testimonio fascinante del Evangelio del Señor Jesucristo prometido en la historia de la redención, la sangre derramada en la cruz y el pacto de la vida eterna. Así que a través de esta obra, como nos recomendó Dios a través de Moisés, nos recuerda Deuteronomio 32.7. Acuérdate de los tiempos antiguos, considera los años de muchas generaciones, Pregunta a tu padre y él te declarará a tus ancianos y ellos te dirán. Como editorial tenemos un compromiso con los lectores de producir libros que irradian luz y cambian vidas. Les recomiendo esta obra maravillosa, La Lámpara Inextinguible del Pacto. Muchas gracias. I thank God for the opportunity God has given to me and it is a great privilege and honor to attend this Proclaim 2021. I congratulate and wish the Art Center uh, for their effort during this pandemic time. Really, we pray that this meeting would be a great blessing to each one of us, those who are attending in these three days. Let the Holy Spirit speak to each one of us and guide us during these days. We, the Indian field, the ELS, our CLC, are blessed uh, with the Art Center because they are given the copyright to print the Tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant uh, into Tamil language, the beautiful book God has given to us. It is well accepted by our Tamil-speaking people and particularly now uh, we are printing this book into Hindi language and God willing uh, we will translate this book into some other Indian languages too. Uh, also we are waiting for the copyright uh, to print the redemption series into Tamil language. Really it is a great blessing for us, for our country. And uh, once again we thank the Art Center for giving the great opportunity to us to meet with you through this meeting. Also, we pray that the Art Center's ministry may grow more and more, more and more in the coming days. May God bless you. Thank you. Greetings from Scotland. I am here in the north of Scotland, conscious of the fact that we are separated by geography and because of this worldwide pandemic. How thankful I am that we can meet together in the one great location at the foot of the cross of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. The challenges we are living with are moral decline, political unrest, the relentless secular advance, serious poverty, together with the denial of the authority of God's word. This and the reality of judgment and eternity are neglected by our society and, alas, increasingly by the church worldwide. These challenges highlight for us the great need for us to cherish God's word and to live it. As I speak to you from the community where the missionary John Ross was born, 
I remember with thankfulness hearing as a child of his ministry for Korea. In 1887, John Ross finished the translation of the New Testament in Korean, and that great gift was brought to you. I encourage you to persevere in the ministry that John Ross was engaged in. May you all continue to cherish the great gift of the word of God and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ so that you will be more aware of his work and intercession for us. He is the word made flesh. May you say, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of God. May you see that the fields around you and around the world are white and ready to harvest. May we all declare with joy in every way possible that he, the Lord Jesus, is altogether lovely. May we say with all our hearts, thanks be unto God for his indescribable gift. And blessings in the name of the Lord. And welcome to Proclaim 2021, the fourth global conference for preachers of redemptive history. We have the honor and blessing tonight to be joined by brothers and sisters of faith from 38 nations from around the world. Now I see that many of you are tuning in through Zoom, but there are those of you who have turned your cameras off uh, if you may, please don't be shy, turn on your cameras and let us greet each other as a family of faith. Blessings, blessings. Thank you so much. I am Evangelist Jabez Park and I have the honor and pleasure to be your MC for this event this week. On behalf of the R Center, who has organized this conference, and also on behalf of Pyongyang Jail Church, who has graciously hosted this conference, I would first like to give all honor and glory to our Father God for bestowing upon us this opportunity to commune together in faith and worship our God by drawing closer to his word. Now the theme of this event is the scriptures were opened, taken from Luke chapter 24, verse 32. In Luke chapter 24, our Lord Jesus Christ has resurrected, but he has not yet revealed himself to his disciples. Two of Jesus' followers were on the road to Emmaus, and they were discussing with each other the events of Jesus' crucifixion and the rumors of his resurrection. Our Lord Jesus appeared to these followers and he revealed the scriptures to them, the law and the prophets. Yet, these followers could not recognize who Jesus was. As evening came, they entered the village, they were breaking bread, and the disciples' eyes were opened. They recognized Jesus Christ and at that moment, he vanished from their sight. According to Luke chapter 24, verse 32, the disciples confessed to each other, were not our hearts burning within us as he opened the scriptures? 
the scriptures were opened. It is our hope and prayer that through Proclaim 2021, through the expounding of the word of God, by understanding God's redemptive history, may the scriptures be open to you and may that burning heart also take place within you so that you will have that fervent zeal to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. Now, this event, Proclaim 2021, is based off of the History of Redemption series authored by the Reverend Abraham Park. And the third book of the History of Redemption series, The Unquenchable Lamp of the Covenant, will be the source of this week's lectures. In this third volume of the History of Redemption series, we will expound upon the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the first period from Abraham to King David, as it is recorded in Matthew chapter 1. The Reverend Abraham Park has been blessed with a unique insight into the scriptures by having read the Bible over 1,800 times over 50 plus years of his ministry. He left the History of Redemption series as a legacy of faith for future generations so that upon this grace, they can go forward in their ministries to do even greater works, to testify of even greater works of our Father God so that future generations may come to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it is our pleasure, it is our blessing to host this event it is our hope and prayer that by drawing closer to the word and understanding the word, we will also draw closer to our Father God. Amen? Now, we will continue with our event. As I said before, this is an international audience and we are translating in several different languages. If everyone can make sure that you have chosen the proper translation to understand, let us all be able to understand each other so that we can all commune together and share in the same grace. As we go into our opening prayer, I would like to introduce Dr. Bruce Waltke. He received his Doctor of Theology from Dallas Seminary, his Doctor of Philosophy from Harvard University. He is an award-winning Christian author and was involved in the New American Standard and New International Version translations of the Bible. Dr. Walkie will now give our opening prayer. Let us pray. Most merciful Triune God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We humbly confess we have not loved you with our whole heart. Nevertheless, you told us to come boldly to your throne of grace because you have cleansed us in the blood of Jesus Christ and clothed us in his righteousness. We praise you for Dr. Reverend Abraham Park and for a series of books on the history of redemption. He kept your command. You commanded us to make your deeds known to our descendants so that the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. And they in turn would tell their children who would then put their trust in you and keep your commands. We know there is no room for neutrality or passivity in keeping this command of preaching the history of redemption. For if we do not make known your praiseworthy deeds, how will future generations know of your history of redemption centered in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved? We realize that the faith of your people is only one generation away from extinction. Your redemptive deeds are more than we recount, so we limit our praise to your redemptive acts in the generation of Moses and Joshua, for the plagues you afflicted on Egypt in the region of Zone, and preserved our fathers in the land of Goshen. You divided the sea and led our fathers through. You made the water stand up like a wall. You guided them with the cloud by day and with the light of fire from night, all night. You split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them water as abundant as the seas. You brought streams out of a rocky crag 
and made water flow down like rivers. And paradoxically, as you made water burst from the rocks on the desert floor, you rained down grain and meat from the skies. You gave a command to the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. You rained down manna for the people to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. You let loose east winds from the heavens and by your power made the south wind blow. You rained down meat on them as thick as dust, birds as plentiful as sand on the seashore. And so you brought our father safely to your holy land. Above all, however, we will tell how the high priest treated your holy son with contempt and handed him over to Pontius Pilate, who had him crucified on the hardwood of the cross. We will tell how you outsmarted the high priest, for through killing your son, the unbelieving priest unwittingly offered the sacrificial lamb for the sins of the world according to your plan before anything existed. We will tell how he raised your son from the dead, and that sweet he swallowed up death. We will count how, after his resurrection, he appeared to his disciples, and then, before their eyes, he ascended into heaven. And when he had sat down at the right hand of, of, of your majesty, the Holy Spirit stood up, and the exalted Christ sent the Holy Spirit with the four winds of heaven and with fiery tongues that spoke the languages of the world and your people, though speaking different languages, yet having the same spirit, understood one another. Since then you have kept your promise to build your church. It began as small as a mustard seed, but is now, but now a tree that covers the whole earth. It began in Asia Minor and then moved to Europe and from there to the United States. And now that tree flourishes most gloriously in Korea. To build your church, you have given her gifted theologians like Paul and Calvin. You gave her evangelists like Philip and Billy Graham. And you gave her pastor teachers like Timothy and Abraham Park. So now, Lord, we pray that at this conference, your spirit will anoint with power and clarity those who will open your life-giving word of this history of redemption. May we leave here having added substance to our faith, order to our virtue, conviction to our confession, and be nerved to fidelity and testing. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Dr. Welke, for opening up the doors of blessing for this event. Let us continue to offer a sweet aroma that rises up to heaven and prepare our hearts with a special song of praise. Sujin Park will now give a special rendition of He's Got a Whole World in His Hands.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We will now lead into our lectures. Before we begin, uh, many of you have received booklets that will have notes for the lectures. We encourage you to take notes and a quick note as you hear the astonishing word of redemptive history. You might receive a particular grace. You might actually have some questions. If you do, there will be an opportunity to lift up your questions for our moderators so that they can be answered later through our center. So please keep that in mind. There will be another prompt as lectures end. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our first lecturer. Reverend Dr. Philip Lee. He received his degree in business administration from Seoul National University, his Master of Divinity from Chongqing Theological Seminary, his Doctor of Ministry from Knox Theological Seminary, and his Doctor of Theology from Faith Theological Seminary in the United States. He is the executive director of our center in Korea, as well as the senior pastor of the Pyongyang Jail Church. And in this first lecture, he will discuss the genealogies of the first and second Adam. Let us greet one another, hallelujah. It's so wonderful to see you all. In the year 2018, we had the proclaimed global conference, and because of the coronavirus pandemic, after three years, we were, we were able to meet again. Only Jesus is our Savior. Among our many sins, we who are destined to die because of our sins, Jesus is the only one that can resolve our sins. So if we believe in Jesus, all of our sins will be resolved. The Bible is 100% the Word of God. And so for us, we must believe in the Bible 100%. And according to God's word, we must live out our lives. This History of Redemption seminar was started first by Reverend Abraham Park. Reverend Abraham Park believed in the Bible as 100% the word of God. And only through Jesus Christ can we receive salvation. And that is what he believed. And the, he, and the Bible, from the redemptive historical perspective, was interpreted. And from the redemptive historical perspective, he organized all of the grace that he received through the Word and authored the History of Redemption series. So today's lecture is based on Book 3 of the History of Redemption series, The Unquenchable Lamp of the Covenant. And through this book, I would like to proclaim the Word of God to you all. When we look at this, the subject for our seminar, the theme is the scriptures were opened, and this is the theme for this proclaimed global conference. The scriptures being opened is not something that is done by the power of man, but through the Holy Spirit, it is opened. And so Reverend Abraham Park ascended Mount Jiri here in Korea, and for three years, six months, and seven days, he prayed earnestly before God, asking him to help him understand the scriptures. And through the blessing that he received, through the Bible, he discovered Jesus Christ. In John chapter 5, verse 39, there's this word that says, All scripture testifies of Jesus. All scripture testifies only of Jesus. And so in the Bible, 
We must find Jesus. The history of redemption series authored by Reverend Abraham Park finds Jesus and Jesus being discovered was authored and recorded. Through the seminar today, may we discover Jesus. May we believe in Jesus until the very end and in so doing, Until the day that Jesus comes again, may not one person be left out so all of us may greet the returning Lord. First, the subject of lecture one is the genealogies of the first and second Adam. This is based on Genesis chapter 5 verse 1 and Matthew chapter 1 verse 1. Now, redemptive history, redemptive history, there are four great elements to it. First is the creation of God. Second is the fall. Third is the restoration. When something is broken, we throw it away in the trash can, but God does not throw anything away. He wants to fix us and will use us again. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it tells us that Jesus Christ, if we are in Him, we will be a new creation. And the fourth element is perfection. By Jesus' second coming, all of redemptive history will be perfected. And so God's redemptive history begins with Adam, In this, uh, on this uh, marker board, we, we're recording in English and Spanish. So it begins with Adam and ends with Adam. That's how the Bible is recorded. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, it says that the first man, Adam, came, and then there's the last Adam. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 47, it says that the first man appears, and the second man appears. And the second, man, the second Adam is Jesus. The last Adam is Jesus. So why is Jesus being described as Adam? Adam is a man. Jesus, in order to save us, was the Word that became flesh. God came as a man, and it is expressed that He was Adam. But the difference is that the first Adam had sinned, but the second Adam, Jesus, was without sin. And that's why when you look in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 25, it says that Jesus Christ was without sin. And that is how it is recorded. So only Jesus is our Savior. Through the first Adam, God wanted to show how the second Adam and the last Adam would come. And so in Romans chapter 5, verse 14, look there. In Romans chapter 5, verse 14, it says that Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So the first Adam is a type of the second Adam. Through Adam, through the first Adam, the second Adam, Jesus, we can come to understand who he would be. However, the first Adam is the creation. The second Adam, Jesus, is God. There's, a, there's that difference. And so, through the image of the first Adam, we can, we can come to understand how the second Adam, Jesus, would come and what he will do. The genealogy of the first Adam is uh, recorded in Genesis chapter 5, and the second Adam's genealogy is recorded in Matthew chapter 1. So today, the genealogy of the first Adam and the genealogy of the second Adam, I would like to compare these two genealogies and share the grace of God's word with you all today. First, let's look at the uh, outline and the history of the two genealogies. First, we'll look at the first Adam's genealogy. Now, the first Adam's genealogy is structured with ten people. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. We see these ten people comprise the genealogy. 
And so from Adam until Noah's birth, this is 1,056 years of time. And then Noah lived until the age of 950. And so from Adam until Noah's death, until his death, is 2,006 years. And this vast work of history is contained in this in this genealogy. And so should we look at the genealogy? In Genesis chapter 5 verse 1, when we look there, we see uh, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In Hebrew, this is Sefer Toledoth. Sefer means book. And Toledot means genealogy. And so the parentheses are the Spanish words. Now, it's not just a genealogy, but it's a book of the genealogy. And so in this short genealogy, there's a vast, um, vast content of God's redemptive history. So it's not a genealogy, but it's a book of the genealogy. Now, when we look at the characteristics of this book of the genealogy, we see the age at which they had their sons. And after they had their sons, we see how many years they lived after, and we see at the age at which they died. So Adam, at the age of 130, but became the father of Seth and lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters and died at the age of 930. God records the genealogy of Adam, the genealogy of Seth, in this way where he precisely records the age. What does this mean? God is taking an interest in this genealogy. Now think about this. How old is your oldest son? If he's 25, then you could tell them that he's 25. Why? Because he's my child. How old is the oldest son of someone else's uh, son? You don't care. Why? Because they're not my ch- they're not my children. And so God, in Genesis chapter 4, in the genealogy of Cain, it does not record at what age they had their sons. It makes no difference at what age they had their sons because God did not take an interest in that genealogy because they are not his children. However, for the children of God, God takes an interest in this. And so he records all of the ages here. Within these ages contain uh, the great mysteries and redemptive administration of God. Reverend Abraham Park, he studied these ages and authored the History of Redemption series. We just say someone had at this age and had this son and this son and uh, stop having children. And we then we close the Bible. But now, we have to understand that the entire Word of God is the Bible. Even the numbers that were recorded are the Word of God. And so when we look at the redemptive administration contained in these numbers, we have to understand what they are. So what's the most important thing in the first Adam's genealogy? Adam's ninth generation was Lamech. Adam lived until the age of 930. When Lamech was born, how old was Adam? You, if you add up the numbers 130 to 187, what do you get? You get 874. When Adam was, when Lamech was born, Adam's age was 874. And so when you subtract 874 from 930, you get 56. And so Adam and Lamech lived contemporaneously for a period of 56 years. Why would God cause Adam to live this long period of time to meet Lamech? Until Lamech was born, God desired for his faith to be transmitted unto him. He wanted the faith to be transmitted. Lamech, at the age of 182, became the father of Noah. And after he became the father of Noah, what was confessed? God cursed the ground and man would work for the toil of the ground. How in Genesis chapter 2, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 to 19, this cursing of the ground occurs in the Garden of Eden. 
And Lamech could not have known that that occurred because he was not in the Garden of Eden. But Lamech understood this. How would he have known this? His grandfather, Adam, by living with him for 56 years, learned this from him. Our grandfather, Adam, he fell and God cursed the ground. And so that is why we are working in such agony working uh, this ground with the toil of our hands. And now, the Messiah who would resolve this problem would be great if he came. This kind of uh, uh, fervent hope he had, and he named his son Noah, which means rest. And by God causing Adam to live this long period of time, Adam's faith was transmitted until Lamech. That's what he desired. He desired for Adam's faith to be transmitted to Lamech. And so for us, we must transmit our faith to our children, to your children. The method to making money, the method to studying well, the method to getting a good job, teaching. That's all important. However, what's more important than any of those things is that by only believing in Jesus and by only trusting in Jesus, we are teaching of them of that faith. In that faith, all of that is contained. If you have faith, you can do anything. Jesus, in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, said, If you can, all things are possible to him who believes. The believers, if they believe, you can do anything. If you transmit that faith, your children can do anything. And so, just as Adam transmitted his faith to Lamech, today, may that faith be transmitted unto you, and may that faith be transmitted unto your children. No matter how rampant the coronavirus pandemic may be, no matter what the devil Satan might try to do to interfere, let us keep the faith until the very end, and I pray these blessings upon you all in the name of the Lord. And so Adam and Lamech lived together contemporaneously for a period of 56 years. 56 years. They lived contemporaneously together. And God wanted transmission of faith. God wanted transmission of faith. God wanted the transmission of faith. And now, we'll look at the second Adam's genealogy. The second Adam's genealogy, this is Jesus' genealogy. Jesus' genealogy it records 41 people, but there are 42 generations. David is recorded, is counted twice in this genealogy. He concludes the first period of Jesus' genealogy, and David begins the second period of Jesus' genealogy. And so there are 41 people, but there are 42 generations. And Matthew chapter 1, verse 17 records this. And so if we organize this, Jesus' genealogy can be organized into the first period, the second period, and the third period. The first period is from Abraham's birth until David, the king of Israel. And this is a period of 1,163 years and records 14 generations. And then the second period goes from King David until the deportation to Babylon. And so when they were deported to Babylon this, for the second uh, deportation, this is in 597 BC, this covers a period of 506 years of history. Now, 1003 BC is when David became the king over all of Israel. And the third period is from the deportation of Babylon until the coming of Jesus. And so this covers a history of 593 years. Now, what's the most important thing in this genealogy? When you look in Matthew chapter 1, verse 16, uh, how is it recorded there? It says, Jesus was born of Mary, of Mary by whom Jesus was born. Of Mary. Mary is a woman. Mary, wa Mary was able to conceive Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Abraham became the father of Isaac. Isaac became the father of Jacob. And we see the man became, became the father of a son. If that's the case, Joseph 
would have become the father of uh, of Jesus. Joseph, the father of Jesus. It would be correct to record it this way, but the Bible does not record it in this fashion. But it says of Mary by whom Jesus was born. And so Jesus was born of the woman, that he is the seed of the woman. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it says that the seed of the woman will come to crush the head of the serpent. And Jesus is that seed. That is the, the core of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, when you look there, it says that the ancient serpent, the dragon, is Satan, the devil. The one that crushes the head of the serpent is only Jesus. Why do you sin? Why do you hate others? Hate, hatred is murder, the sin of murder. Why do you disobey the word of God in your livelihoods? It is because you are all tempted by the devil and you live in this fashion. Can you overcome the devil? You can't. But the seed of the woman would come to crush the head of the serpent. And if you just believe in Jesus and you're in Jesus, even if you stay still, Jesus will crush the head of Satan. And that is why we believe in Jesus, the seed of the woman who was born of the woman. This is the core of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So let's look in your lecture notes. Jesus came as the seed of the woman. And this was a fulfillment of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Today, Jesus who came as the seed of the woman in your families, businesses, workplaces, and in your countries, may all the darkness of Satan all be crushed and destroyed. COVID-19, please believe that Jesus will destroy it. Let's go to main point number two. We'll look at the continuity and discontinuity of the two genealogies. And what this means simply is that there are there omissions or are there not omissions in the genealogy? So if I give the conclusion, in Adam's genealogy, the first Adam's genealogy, there is no omission. Why? Because it tells us at what age they had their son, and so there are no omissions. And so the first Adam's genealogy is continuous. There are no omissions in that genealogy. And so from Adam until Enoch, the seventh generation, let's look at that genealogy. We can see whether it's continuous or discontinuous. We can see this from Jude chapter 1, verse 14. Here it says, now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, it says. It says, Hep domos apo Adam henok. This means in Greek, seventh from Adam, Enoch. Inclusive of Adam, Enoch is the seventh from him. Should we confirm this for ourselves? Adam is the first generation, right? Adam is the first generation. And then is Seth the second, Enoch the third, Kenan the fourth, Mahalalel the fifth, Jared the sixth, and Enoch the seventh. And so from Adam, Apo Adam, Heptomos, the seventh is Enoch. In Jude chapter 1 verse 14, it is precisely correct in Jude chapter 1 verse 14. In the, between these generations, there are no omissions. And so the genealogy of Adam is a continuous genealogy. And from, we can also see this from Enoch as well, is continuous. Enoch at the age of 65 became the father of Methuselah. And Methuselah, if you look at the meaning of Methuselah, what does Methuselah mean? Methuselah in Hebrew is Mut Shalach. Metu Shalach. Metu means the end. And Shalach, this means to send. And so God, to, to Enoch at the age of 65, he had his son, he names him Methuselah. Methuselah means the end. 
Now, I, let's say I had a son, and my last name is Lee. And this is how you write it in Chinese. And I name my son the end. And so to my wife, I say, I, I will have to ask her, does my son come home? I call her and I say, son, did the end come? Oh, the end already came. Honey, the end already came? What? The end already came? Every time you look at the sun, you think of the end of the world coming. And God caused him to think of the end times. Because of his son, Enoch was able to walk with God. And we're going to study this in a moment. But Enoch, at, from the age of 65, he began to walk with God. Before then, he was unable to walk with God. Why was it that he began to walk with God at the age of 65? It's because he had Methuselah at the age of 65. And as a result, Enoch, because of his son, was able to walk with God. And so for all of you, if you desire to walk with God, then today, change your son's name. Name him Enoch, like Enoch did. Name him the end. Or whether you change it to Methuselah. In English, you can change it to the end. Hey, end, bring some water. Hey, end, have you come already? Oh, the end already came. And it's to think in this manner. But the amazing fact here is that Methuselah lived until the age of 969, and when Methuselah died, that's when the end of the world actually came. When Methuselah died, the end of the world came. Now look here. Methuselah, Methuselah lived until the age of 969. But Methuselah at the age of 187 became the father of Lamech, and Lamech at the age of 182 became the father of Noah. And Noah at the age of 600 is when God judged the world through the flood and brought the end. So 187 plus 182 plus 600, you get 969. And Methuselah died at the age of 969. And so as soon as Methuselah died, when Methuselah dies, the end will come. Methuselah has died. And so he tells Noah, enter the ark. At, the, at Noah's 600 year, on the 10th day of the second month, he was told to go into the ark. And so when you look at the Seder Olam that the Jews read, or the books of all, the Seder Olam, Methuselah dies on the 10th day of the second month and at the age of 969 as Methuselah died he tells Noah quickly enter the ark this amazing secret of the Bible is in the Bible but because our spiritual eyes are dim we cannot see it but Reverend Abraham Park he studied the genealogy for his entire life and shares with us the amazing mysteries of redemptive administration of God. So, for all of you, please read the History of Redemption series. What I'm teaching here is from Book 1, the Gene Genesis Genealogies. This is contained in the Genesis Genealogies. And so let's look at what's in our lecture notes here. The genealogy is continuous from Enoch until Noah. The reason is because Enoch had Methuselah at the age of 65. I explained all this to you. And this is recorded in Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 to 22, that Enoch had became the father of Methuselah at the age of 65 and then walked with God. And then Methuselah lived 969 years and died. This is recorded in Genesis chapter 5, verse 27. And then what happened when Methuselah died? Methuselah means when he dies, the end. The end will be sent. And so earlier through this genealogy, I explained this to you all. Methuselah at the age of 187 became the father of Lamech. Lamech at the age of 182 became the father of Noah. And Noah at the age of 600 that is when God sent the flood to the world and judged the world accordingly. 
And we could see this uh, here. Methuselah had Lamech at the age of uh, had Lamech at the age of 187. Lamech had Noah at the age of 182. The flood came at Noah's age of 600. Therefore, the end of the world came at Methuselah's age of what? 969. And that's the year that Methuselah died. When Methuselah died, the end would come, and this was fulfilled. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 25, 5, verse 28, and chapter 7, verse 6, this is contained here. And so we looked here at the first Adam's genealogy being continuous. On the other hand, the second Adam's genealogy, Jesus' genealogy, is discontinuous. The reason is because in Jesus' genealogy, it begins with Abraham and ends with Jesus. Abraham was born in the year 2166 B.C. Jesus' birth occurs in the year 4 B.C. Therefore, Jesus' genealogy contains 2,162 years of history. Now, if you divide this by 40, you get about 54 years here. One generation, more often than not, they consider it to be 25 to 30 years. However, here one generation is to be 54 years. This tells us that there were many more generations. But in Jesus' genealogy, God purposefully omitted them from the genealogy. Why? Some people ask, why do you divide by 40? Let's think of it in this way. Here we have Abraham. And then we have Isaac, and we have Jacob. Now, there are three men, but the gap of time, this is one generation here. And here is another generation. And so these three people, you see two generations. You see that time period. In Jesus' genealogy, there are 41 people recorded, and so there are 42 generations. And so earlier, I said that if you divide 2,162 by 40, you get about 54 years. One generation is about 54 years, but generally speaking, it's about 25 to 30 years. In, gen in Jesus' genealogy, we can understand that there are many generations that were omitted. God took out people that were not necessary to the genealogy. For example, in a particular company, there's an employee uh, that where you have too many employees. You have, let's say you have 30 employees. But the, let's say the chairman decides that I want to uh, have a dinner with employees. It's the best uh, restaurant in the world, but I can only take 14 people. So just bring 14 employees. And so you have to take out 16 people. The who the chairman does not care for, yet they have to fall out. And so for us, we must live a life where God uh, really takes an interest with us, where God uh, wants to take us to the restaurant. And so in order to fix this period to only 14 generations, he took out the unnecessary generations. We're going to study this, but who fell out? Through this proclaimed conference, if you attend, we're going to find out the answer. Let us not miss uh, the event and hear all the lectures. Main point number three, there are different endings of the two genealogies, but how are they different? Now, in Jesus' genealogy, the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the first Adam's genealogy ends with died. And so in Adam's genealogy, in Genesis chapter 5, verse 5, verse 8, verse 11, verse 14, verse 17, verse 20, 27, 31, it says that they lived until, they lived this many years and they died. And Seth uh, lived uh, this many years and died, and this is recorded in this way. A Adam's descendants all died. Why? Adam's sin uh, was passed on to his descendants, and they all died. In Adam's genealogy, from Genesis chapter 5, verse 1 to Genesis chapter 9, verse 29, in chapter 9, verse 29, it ends with the death of Noah. 
that all the days of Noah were 950 years and he died. And so Adam's genealogy, the first Adam, they all died. This is uh, quite sad, actually. If that's the case, why did they all have to die? Through Adam's disobedience, sin, Adam's sin, this is the original sin, the original sin. All of that was passed on to the following generations. If the president who is the representative of the country, if that president, if he has a, he makes a, a, a bad agreement with another country, the citizens will all be in an uproar. In the same way, Adam is the representative of all mankind. Through Adam's original sin, this was passed on to all the people. And so in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says that through one man, Adam, sin came into the world and sin, uh, death was, sin and death came to all mankind. In Romans chapter 5, verse 18 to 19, and this is contained here, and I also explained Romans chapter 5, verse 12, and as a result, it says the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. And so in Adam's genealogy, it's expressed that they all, end, it ends with that they died. On the other hand, the second Adam's genealogy, uh, thankfully, in Jesus' genealogy, the second Adam, the second Adam is Jesus. In Jesus' genealogy, it does not end with died. How does it end? It, it only continues through begot, begot, and begot. When the child is born, how wonderful is it? This is life. This is a new life being born. This is the birth of a new life. How wonderful is that? And so the genealogy of Jesus is, uh, it contains the birth of life. And so the second Adam's genealogy ends uh, with birth, but at the end, it ends with the birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus. There's a person who only has, who only became the father of nine daughters, and at the end, says, honey, let's have one more child. And so they had the child, and the tenth child is a son. In the household, they would be in, overjoyed because of this news. It's wonderful just to have a son. In the genealogy of Jesus, the fact that it ends with the birth of Jesus, Jesus is the living. And not just the living, but He, he is eternity. He is everlasting. He is the living forever. And so what does this teach us? We as the, the descendants of Adam, we have to die, but Jesus who is the living forever, if we are linked to him, then we will not die, but we will be the living as well. We will be changed to the living because Jesus is the living forever. What great news, what great news is this for us? Jesus the living came. What better good news could there be? And so in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, this is the best good news you can get in the world. But we do not know this. Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, uh, and they kept having fathers and became begot, 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 and we say, stop having sons, and we see just uh, how pitiful this is. And so when we look here, Jesus is the living forever. Jesus was born of Mary in Egeneven, in the passive tense. This means that Jesus came uh, through the Holy Spirit. Joseph's seed did not go into Mary at all. And so Abraham and Isaac, Isaac and Jacob, Jacob and uh, Judah, we see all of that, all of that is written in the active, active tense. That is not the work of the Holy Spirit. However, Jesus' birth, only in that case, was he born through the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is alive forever. Jesus is alive forever. We are the descendants of Adam, and so we can only die, but when we believe in Jesus and when we go into Jesus, then we will too will become the living. Jesus, after he died on the cross, the women, 
they looked for him. And what did the angel say at the time? Why are you searching for the living uh, in the tomb? Jesus is not the dead, but he's the living. And at that, he's the living forever. And so in Luke chapter 24, verse 5, it says, Why do you seek the living among the dead? In Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, Jesus Christ is the living one. And at that, he's alive forevermore. Jesus is alive forevermore. And so Jesus died on the cross and Jesus' body was hung to the cross. But Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. When they died, he could have, he could have been killed himself, but he said, give me the body of Jesus. And at that, Joseph of Arimathea did not ask for the corpse of Jesus. He asks for the body of Jesus, Soma. This word Soma means the living body. And so Joseph of Arimathea, even if Jesus died, Jesus is not dead, but he's the living, he's alive forevermore. He believed in this. And so he asked for the living body of Jesus. In Mark chapter 15, verse 43. And Pilate, who could not believe, in verse 45, it says that he gave him the body, Potoma. Potoma, this means corpse. He gave the corpse. And that's how Mark chapter 15, verse 45 is recorded. And so for all of you, Jesus died. We must not believe it in that manner. Jesus, even though he took upon himself the sins on the cross, he died. That's the fact. But even though he's dead, he is he the dead or the living? He's the living. He's alive forevermore. And that is why after three days he resurrected. And so if you believe in that Jesus, I'm not the dead, but I too am the living. And so we see he asks for the living body, the word Soma. And look at your lecture notes closely. In Mark chapter 15, verse 43, it's recorded as Soma. But Pilate, when he responds in Mark chapter 15, verse 45, he uses the word potoma, meaning corpse. And so, when we too believe in Jesus, we also become the living. And so in John chapter 5, verse 24, it says, He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. In John chapter 5, verse 24, it says that whoever believes in him who sent me has eternal life. The word has is used in the present, uh, in the present tense, in eke in Greek. This is used in the present tense. If I believe in Jesus right now, I've already received eter everlasting life. Have you received everlasting life? You have. It's already, uh, from the moment that I begin to believe, I've received it. And so today, please believe that we will not die going forward. Even if we die, we will resurrect. And when alive, when we meet Jesus, we will be transfigured. And so I'm going to give the conclusion here. The two images of the living, the two images of the living. Jesus lives forever. We are the dead. Jesus is the living, the one who lives forever. And so when we believe in that Jesus, then we too will be the living. And so Jesus is the one who lives forever. And when we believe in this Jesus, we will be moved from the dead to the living. And we've already received eternal life. And when, the, when Jesus comes again, we will uh, resurrect or when we're alive, we will be transfigured. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 52, at the sound of the last trumpet, the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall all be changed. In John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, it says that whoever believes in me shall never die. This is the resurrection. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He asked this question. What's important here 
It says that the believer here in Greek is pistu o on. This is used in the present participle. Jesus, it's speaking of the resurrection and the transfiguration in the present form. Lazarus had been dead for four days, and everyone was crying and weeping for Lazarus. Our if you had come sooner, our brother would not have died. Where have you been? And they were shedding tears and, and, and grumbling. At that, Jesus said, "Your brother is a, your brother will live." All you have to say is "Amen." And Martha was saying, "Lord, I know that resurrection will be given in the last days." But Jesus said, "Those who believe in me, if you believe in me, they will they will live even if they die, and even if you live, if you believe in me, you will never die. Do you believe in this?" He was asking this question. And Lazarus, who was dead, was raised again. And so the resurrection, when the Lord comes again, we are assured of the transfiguration and the resurrection. The, re the end time resurrection, the end time transfiguration, it's my present resurrection and the present transfiguration. That's what it's telling us. We must believe in that and that is how we will live. We always say that we're, it's so hot I could die, I have no money, I feel like I can die. We're frustrated we can die. We say that we can die. Why? That resurrection and that transfiguration, it's not in the present tense, it's not here with me in the present. I'm the living. I'm not the dead. We cannot say that we are dying if we're the living. So starting today, let's stop saying that we are dying. Reverend Abraham Park, if we said that we felt that we were dying, he caused a, it was a storm that would come from him. And so, let's say, I'm so hungry I could live, or it's so hot I can live. Oh, my children are causing so much heartache I could die. Let's not say that. Let's say, uh, my heart is aching so much I feel like I live. That's, that is the real uh, faith that you have when you believe in Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 and 52, John chapter 11, verse 25 through 26. Now, there's not much time. So in Adam's genealogy, Enoch became the fruit of transfiguration. And so in Adam's genealogy, the, to be the fruit of transfiguration, this is the dead or the living. This is the living. Ultimately, we must become the living, and that's what it is showing, showing to us. And when you look at this genealogy, when Enoch was born, Adam's age was 622. Because when you add up all the ages from when Adam was born, you get that. And at Enoch's age of 65, he began to walk with God, and Adam was 687 at this time. And then 243 years later, Adam dies at the age of 930, and that was when Enoch was 308 years old. And after Adam died, 57 years later, Enoch was transfigured and ascended to heaven. Adam, to Enoch, said, hey, Enoch, you must live by obeying the word of God. Your grandfather... Because he disobeyed the word of God, I was driven out from the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, God said not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. From the day that I eat of it, you will surely die. This means if I do not eat of it, but obey, I will live forever. But your grandfather was unable to believe, and so I was driven out. But you, please believe in the word of God. Enoch as well, for the first 65 years of his life, did not, did not listen to his grandfather's words. Adam, for 65 years, waited so that Enoch would understand. How old are your children right now? Oh, my child is 30 years old and still does not understand. It's, he's still a ways off. Endurance, perseverance is necessary. And so from the age of 65, Enoch suddenly changed after having Methuselah and understood and obeyed the word of God and lived his life. That's walking with God. If you disobey the word of God, is that walking with God? No. When you obey the word of God, you walk with God. And by obeying the word of God, that's when Adam died. And after Adam died, 57 years later, Enoch was transfigured 
And the word that Adam had proclaimed, this was revealed. If you obey the word of God, you will not die, but you will live. But the living actually appeared because he went to heaven alive. And so Enoch, the word that Adam proclaimed, he's the fruit of that word. He's the fruit of obedience. And so we too must become that fruit. The one that taught the word of transfiguration went first. But what's great about Enoch is that even after Adam died, unchangingly, he still walked with God. Are you walking with God in an unchanging manner? That is a true walk with God. That is truly believing in God. That content we can see in the next uh, subject. Adam was 622 years old when Enoch was born. And then, in this genealogy, until Enoch was born, just add up these, num- these first uh, six numbers here. You see, you'll get Adam's age. This is 622. And then Adam was 687 years old when Enoch became the father of Methuselah, and that's when Enoch began walking with God. Third, 243 years after Enoch began walking with God, Adam dies at the age of 930. And so Enoch was 308 years old when Adam died. And so Enoch, after living 308 years until when Adam died, he was 308 years old. And among them, For the first 65 years of his life, he did not walk with God. But the remaining uh, 243 years, he did walk with God. He walked with God during the rest of the 243 years. But what's greater is that uh, after Adam died, he continued to walk with God. And so for 300 years, he walked with God altogether. And so after Adam's death, Enoch walked with God 57 more years and then was taken to heaven without seeing death. Therefore, Enoch was a fruit of obedience to the word proclaimed by Adam. In John chapter 8, verse 51, Jesus said, Most assuredly, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. And as a result, we must walk with God. Walking together with God is to be one with God. Walking together is oneness or unity. And so Jesus, in John chapter 17, verse 21, spoke this word. Jesus said, Father, as you are in me, and I in you. And as a result, Jesus and the Father, Jesus of the life of being one with the Father. In this way, for us to walk with God, then that means we must become one with God. We must embrace the heart of God. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Have this attitude within you, the mind of Jesus, the attitude of Jesus. When we have the thoughts of Jesus, when we do the things that Jesus delights in, when we do the things that Jesus desires for us to do, that's what we must do in our lives. And so we must become one with Jesus. How can we embrace the heart of Jesus? This Bible is 100% the heart of God that is recorded because it is 100% the heart of God. And so the Bible is something that you must diligently read, study it, and when you understand it, then you will have the heart of God. And that's when you begin to walk with God. How many times have you read the Bible over the course of your life? In our, in our church, our uh, elementary school students, seven, eight-year-olds, they read the Bible more than 10 times a year. If you read the Bible many times, then this Bible, it becomes thicker and thicker because the pages become worn. Reverend Abraham Park read the Bible over 800 times, 1,800 times. And so he had many copies of these thick Bibles. 
And so when you have and embrace the heart of God and read, and he authored the history of redemption series, he's teaching us of the heart of, of God. I've only given a lecture on only a small part of this book. So please uh, purchase this book in English and Spanish so that you may draw all draw closer to the word of God. And like Enoch, may you all walk with God and become the fruit of obedience. When you look here, this is Reverend Abraham Park, who authored the History of Redemption series, and this is the English book, The Unquenchable Lamp of the Covenant. Here is the Spanish book that's been translated. And so, please read the History of Redemption series, authored by Reverend Abraham Park, and let's embrace the heart of God and let us walk with God. And just as he did, and just as Enoch embraced the heart of God and walked with God, May all of you, for the remainder of your lives, embrace the heart of God and do the things that pleases God. And I pray these blessings upon you all in the name of the Lord. Let's offer up a prayer. Father God, we thank you so much. Today, you have loved us and you have led our footsteps to this History of Redemption Seminar. For that, we give you thanksgiving. Our Father God, Enoch taught the word of God to Lamech and Adam taught the word of God to Enoch and Lamech. May we too also teach the word of God to our children. Only Jesus is the living forever. May we believe in Jesus until the very end so that we may be able to go into the living forever. The resurrection of Jesus is my resurrection. The transfiguration at the end may be today's transfiguration. May we be able to embrace the heart of Jesus and by walking together with the Word of God. Father God, because of COVID-19, we are going through great difficulties in our lives. In these times of difficulties, may we not lose our faith. At this time, I command in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for all of the churches around the world, may there be a revival. For all the churches around the world, may they all be walking with God. We thank you for all things and we pray all this in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ with thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. Were you blessed? I believe you were blessed. I see your faces on the screen. I can't hear you. I'll just believe it. If you were blessed, wave. All right. That is awesome. Uh, you know, the theme verse to all of the History of Redemption series is Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7. And it begins, remember the days of old and consider the years of all generations. So in the very word of God, is the command that we need to study the genealogy. Uh, many of you have participated in past seminars. You might be familiar with this type of study. Most of you participating tonight might be hearing this for the very first time, and you might be shocked to know that through the genealogy, you can have so much content. Now, some of you might be astonished you don't even know what to think. Maybe you're thinking clearly about the Bible for the first time in a while, some of you might have gotten answers to questions you didn't even know to ask. Some of you might be in a situation of asking questions that you didn't even know you could ask. And it is in this regard that we would like to ask feedback from you. Depending on how you registered for this seminar, through Zoom, you will have either a chat room or you will have a question and answer option. If you have any questions, if you have any particular grace, if there is a question you have from the lecture this evening or the history of redemption series as a whole or about the life and ministry of the author, through the options that you have, please write them down. We have moderators that are watching the chat rooms. We have moderators in the question and answer sections that will receive your questions and we will take this feedback to design future lectures to be able to offer more explanations about the history of redemption 
and all in all to have a better fellowship experience with all of you here learning the word of the history of redemption. So please do that at any time. If you do not have the opportunity to do that this evening, at the very end of the seminar, we will also have an overall survey. And in that survey, you will have an opportunity to make your comments and also ask your questions. Each lecture will also be followed by this opportunity to be able to upload your questions and comments. So if you don't do it tonight, you have plenty of opportunities in the time ahead. Now the first lecture has concluded. We're going to take a five minute break. So please take this moment to refresh yourselves. We'll have the timer up on the screen. Let's come back after five minutes with renewed minds, renewed hearts, and continue our lectures in the history of redemption. Thank you very much.
Greetings once again. I hope you had a good break, that you've refreshed yourselves, and now we are back. As it was mentioned earlier, the proclaimed conference taking place this week will be on the third book of the History of Redemption series, The Unquenchable Lamp of the Covenant. What we would like to do at this time is give you a video introduction of what this book is about and the writing and ministry of Abraham Park. The wondrous and unfathomable universe created by the Most High Ruler. We cannot help but admire its vastness and boundlessness. Even with the most advanced technology in the world, we can only catch a glimpse of its vast space. Yet, this God, who is greater than all, gave His infinite, boundless love to save us. The Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is the word of the living God. It reveals His total sovereignty, His magnificent history of redemption to save fallen mankind. Every generation in redemptive history is linked by the covenants that God made with His people. The covenant is God's promise made with mankind because He loves them. Through the covenant, mankind can become intimately united with God. These covenants became the lamp shining upon each era. God's history of redemption linked by these covenants are mysteriously enclosed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and His immeasurable love is sealed into each and every name. Reverend Abraham Park's third book of the History of Redemption series, The Unquenchable Lamp of the Covenant, unravels the condensed history from Abraham to David in the genealogy of Jesus. In the beginning of his ministry, Reverend Park went up to a cave in Mount Jiri, where he devoted himself to prayer and scripture reading for three years. He faced freezing temperatures, extreme hunger, loneliness, and fear. But nothing could outweigh that desperate yearning to understand the scriptures. He sacrificed his comfort and sleep to pray and read the Bible. <laughs> then, God opened his eyes. The scriptures were opened to him, and he could see the Bible with the overarching theme of God's administration of redemption. With this new insight, he wrote down notes on big arrowroot leaves, which he later transferred to pieces of paper. When those began to deteriorate, he transferred it again to notebooks. These countless repetitions eventually led to the publication of the History of Redemption series. The series have been translated into over 18 different languages, aiding the mission of evangelism across nations, helping the readers to see clearly God's message of redemption woven deeply throughout the Bible. The unquenchable lamp of the covenant shows that God's covenant toward each generation are all connected to Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman prophesied in Genesis 3. Matthew 1 testifies that Jesus is the Messiah. Through the genealogy that shows Jesus Christ is the descendant of Abraham and David. The Matthean genealogy of Jesus is the genealogy of faith. 
It does not record every consecutive generation. It is continued only by the people of faith who clung to God's covenants. With this in mind, Reverend Park systematically presents the many generations omitted from the genealogy of Jesus Christ, such as the 430 years of slavery in Egypt, the spiritually dark period of the judges, and the kings omitted from the southern kingdom of Judah. Jesus Christ, the mystery of God, hidden from the past ages and generations, has now been revealed to His saints. His precious blood on the cross is the blood of the covenant, which gives eternal life. The spirit of man whose sins have been forgiven through this precious blood is the lamp of God that breaks the power of darkness and brightens all nations. By understanding Jesus' genealogy, may the lamp of God's zeal and His covenant burn brightly in our hearts among all the nations of the world and throughout the entire universe until the day God's redemptive administration is fulfilled. As we have seen, the history of redemption is the ministry of revealing Jesus Christ through the scriptures. From our center, we sincerely ask of you, not only that you pray for this ministry, but that you also partake in it by learning from the scriptures and understanding God's redemptive administration. As you have just seen, the History of Redemption series, as authored by the Reverend Abraham Park, are being translated and published in various languages all over the world. And for this, we truly ask for your prayers and we truly ask for your assistance to proclaim this word so that it can be spread to all nations. Now, we will see a brief congratulatory address by the Reverend Yong Ho Park, the National Director of CLC Publishing in Korea. For all the saints around the world attending the 2021 Proclaim Global Conference, I would like to sincerely congrat congratulate you all and pray that God's great grace may overflow upon you all. A professor friend of mine gave me as a gift the History of Redemption series book authored by Reverend Abraham Park. And amid reading the books, I was greatly challenged. Reverend Park was a man who thoroughly believed in the absolute sovereignty of God. I heard several of his sermons and met him, and while conversing with him, I realized that God is reigning over all the universe by his absolute sovereignty and that God, in His total authority, blesses and disciplines. He sent the Holy Spirit, which in full manifestation is at work to expand the kingdom of God. He had such an absolutely certain view of faith. Reverend Park came to a deep understanding of the entire Bible through the stem of God's covenants. And he linked those covenants to the events in the Bible and explained them to the saints profoundly well. This book expounds to us the Word of God 
through the stem of his covenants. Going forward, all who read this book will be challenged in amazing ways. To take the initiative in this great work, I have introduced this illustration book of the tabernacle authored by Reverend Park to all our CLC locations worldwide. And right now, in about 20 nations, it is being translated along with the History of Redemption series. I also gratefully gave my utmost cooperation for the recent publication of Book 6 through CLC USA. I pray that the History of Redemption series, authored by our pastor here in Korea, will be made available to bless all those who read it. As we anticipate that this book will be shared with all saints through CLC's 50 locations worldwide, I pray that God's amazing blessings will overflow during this conference and would like to congratulate you all again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, or, originally, we were supposed to have a second lecture at this time. However, I was just informed that due to technical difficulties, we are unable to have the second lecture. So on behalf of our center, I extend my most sincere... You know what? Just forget about everything that I said. <laughs> we do... Wait, please, please stand by. I think we might have resolved our technical issues. And I'm very sorry again. So it turns out that we are unable to continue with our second lecture. So on behalf of our center, I extend my most sincere apologies. Uh, we will try and find another way to make up the content. But that being said, Please let us uh, remember to continue the seminar tomorrow. So once again, with refreshed minds, with refreshed hearts, and with a prayerful spirit, let us meet it once again in communion, in fellowship tomorrow. Let us all conclude this evening or morning, wherever you are, with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's give an applause to glorify our Father God. Once again, I apologize profusely that we have to call it an early day today. But let's meet once again tomorrow in fellowship, in the spirit of love and grace, and sharing in the word of the history of redemption. Thank you very much, and God bless you.